My guest today is a leading Tolkien scholar, so of course we discuss the Lord of the Rings. Welcome to DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Level up your RPG campaigns by filling yourself with stories and knowledge. Explore topics from archaeology to film history to writing to literature and much, much more. This is DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Welcome to the show. My name is Matt and I am your host. This is the DiceGeeks.com tabletop RPG show. This is the podcast where we fill ourselves with stories and knowledge so we can become better game masters and better role players. Now, guys, keeping with my theme of the show, I have an amazing guest today. My guest is a leading Tolkien scholar. This interview is so great. Let's just go ahead and jump in. My guest today is Professor of English. He is also the Director of the Center for the Study of the Medieval at Wheaton College. He is also a leading Tolkien scholar, Dr. Michael Drought. Dr. Drought, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate being invited on. Oh, no problem. It is my pleasure. Just to get us started off, I I just wanted to ask you a little about your career. How does one become a Tolkien scholar? (laughs) Um, (laughs) Against the uh, advice of everyone who... uh, guided me on the on the way uh, into my career um so i mean my my engagement with tolkien goes back to, to when i was a little child uh, supposedly family lore says that that when i was a, a a child a little child i stood up my crib uh, in the spare room at my grandmother's house and pointed at the barbara remington poster of the lord of the rings that was on the wall there and said what that what that and I was fascinated by the the Black Riders, and um, I mean Barbara Remington sadly just passed away recently. But um, I feel like that that was actually a really good question because I don't know what that what that is of her picture, which she apparently painted without having read The Lord of the Rings. Um, <laughs> those were the Valentine paperback covers for decades, and um, and then when I was a little bit older, I was really, really sick one time. And my dad came home from the grocery store with the paperback Hobbit and Lord of the Rings and started reading them out loud to me. And so that was uh, like, when he got to the end, we just had to start over again. So it was always a part of my life there. I made Dungeons and Dragons dungeons based on Lord of the Rings stuff, you know, the quest for the Ellen Dillmere and stuff like that in the, in the 1980s. Um, but then when I went to college, there really wasn't anything to do with, uh, you know, Tolkien. It was just kind of a down period, um, in Tolkien and the popular culture. And, and then I went to grad school and was focusing on, um, after a few false starts, I was focusing on old English, which I took because the catalog description for Professor Foley's old English class said at the bottom of it, West through Hall. Uh, in Old English, which I recognized from Lord of the Rings. So I I took that um, class and from there uh, was focusing on being a medievalist. But my dissertation director said, don't let on that you have this real interest in Tolkien stuff because it'll show that you're frivolous uh, or not a serious scholar. Uh, instead, you have to, you know, s- suggest that you're, you know, only do... Anglo-Saxon stuff. And I'm like, but I'm really interested in Tolkien also. So it's funny now to hear people say like, oh, how do I get a job in Anglo-Saxon if I don't do Tolkien? Because I was told to (laughs) be silent about that. Um, But the the world changed quite a bit, uh, particularly, you know, in 2002 and 2003 um, with the, the, the giant pop cultural success of Peter Jackson's uh, films. Yeah. And uh, just to follow up on a couple of things there, um, I guess one becomes a tabletop role playing game designer the same way one becomes a, a Tolkien scholar against the desires or wishes or thoughts of everybody around them. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Right. Yeah, it's, it's the same thing. It's like, oh, well, you know, you're not going to have a career in that. You can't um, can't do that. Yeah. And. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you you know, can. I mean, on on one hand, I want to say like, well, I can't say you're totally wrong. It's not the easiest thing in the world to do, but um, it's also yeah. you know doing what you really love and are interested in doing. And I'm also wondering why there was a uh, a poster of Lord of the Rings hanging in your uh, grandmother's uh, spare bedroom. So my dad uh, went uh, graduated from from Cornell in 
1969. So it's sort of the height of the yeah. Tolkien, you know, fandom boom. Mm-hmm. And he was really, uh, you know, some of his uh, fraternity brothers had read the book and turned him on to it and he really liked it. And he, so he bought it and you got the free poster from the, the bookstore. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, if you bought the, you know, all four of uh, the Hobbit and the, the Lord of the Rings paperbacks. And I don't know why it got hung on the wall. But I, no one's ever actually told me the answer to that, but it was there. And, 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 and then the funny thing about that is that I guess my cousin and I years, years later found it up my grandmother's attic and we like, we colored on it or something. Oh, no. So it got, it got destroyed. Yeah. Well, when my, my wife was pregnant with, with uh, our daughter, I wanted her to have that map in her, in her room. Mm -hmm. So I went on eBay trying to find it (laughs) and it, I ended up getting into a bidding war with someone and staying up till two in the morning to get the last bid. And, and Raquel had said like, you know, now do not spend more than a hundred dollars on this. Um, $300 later, (laughs) I had my beat up old map. Um, that I had once owned, you know, for free before I colored on it, but it, it's, it hung in my daughter's, it still hangs in her bedroom. Um, so, you know, it was worth it. Now you mentioned obviously that you had played Dungeons and Dragons. Of course, my audience is into Dungeons and Dragons. Does your, does your love of Tolkien inspire you to play Dungeons and Dragons? Or I, I'm just always wondering uh, kind of about the influences. Cause I talk to a lot of people, novelists, and different people who are always saying that at some point in their life they encountered Dungeons and Dragons and that was kind of a formative experience for them. I kind of, I, I think I eased into it mm-hmm. in, in a way, like, because I started uh, playing with uh, my, my best friend in um, high school and junior high. Uh, he started me on Traveler. Okay. Um, that, that was a space uh, you know, a space uh, combat uh, focused game. Mm-hmm. And from there we went to Gamma World. We love Gamma World. We had, uh, I mean, Gamma World was, on. now I look back on it, what a horrible, confusing set of rules and mechanisms, <laughs> but a great idea. Um, so we played played Gamma World. And then from Gamma World, I got into um, Dungeons and Dragons. And then, you know, because I had my interest in Tolkien, I was, and I was always at that point really confused why there weren't obvious like Tolkien monsters like Balrogs yeah. in Dungeons and Dragons because you know nobody I didn't know about like the the lawsuits yeah. and the IP problems and stuff because um, they got sued and they had to take them out. <laughs> right. So what did you get? Instead, you have a Balroar fire demon or something. <laughs> like I kind of love that Gary Gygax made yeah. the absolute <laughs> minimal, most obnoxious, you know. Yeah. A, things a, that he could yeah a, a treant yeah a treant and uh the, the oh, i can keep rangers <laughs> yep oh yeah we can keep rangers and, and halflings and yeah oh yeah. Yeah. it was uh so i you know i would just make my own things i, I was did mostly a dungeon master and i would make my own mm-hmm. um modules you know derivative or it was also like a time like in suburban new jersey in the 1980s there weren't you couldn't get a lot of things. So like I'd read a name, you know, like, Oh, you know, the chapel of elemental evil. And that wasn't in the game store. So I wrote it myself. Yeah. Um, and then did some, these uh, Tolkien inspired ones, or they were mashups where it was like stuff from Tolkien and stuff from sort of Shinara all in the same yeah. world. And that's kind of what I loved about Dungeons and Dragons I mean, I know you can, and many people do play it in a more like a strict, like a Tolkienian sense of these, this is the subset of creatures that are in my world and not this group. Or you can do it kind of like C.S. Lewis, Narnia, and throw the entire kitchen sink yeah. in. Yeah. And that's what I liked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think a lot well, of us like... Not? I think a lot of us like that. We have Babylonian deities and different colored dragons and gelatinous cubes all, you know, fighting with hobbits. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, why not? (laughs) Um, Do you still play or was that just a childhood thing? Um, I, I, somebody described it once as I fell right through the the cracks of that. Mm -hmm. Like by the time I got to college, paper and, uh, so I started college in 86 and like Mm -hmm. paper and and pencil games were sort of dying out. Yeah. And, good video games haven't started yet. Yeah. So I think if I'd been a bit older, I would have been a paper and 
pencil designer player and stuff. And if I had been a bit younger, I would have gotten into the video side of things, but I just had, was in that one point where I didn't really do either. So I've, um, I've done a few, like, you know, play, tried to teach my son. Um, he was interested for a little while, but the, didn't, didn't, um, get as involved. Didn't understand the fun of, you know, the, the rolling lots of dice for probability when, you know, he, his, his view is like, you should click on something and it tell you, tells you who won. Yeah. And, um, so I, I have, I played like a couple of my students invited me to, a um, a D and D night that they had that it was fun, mm-hmm. but I haven't played it, uh, you know, intensely. And I, I've done a bunch of stuff with Lord of the Rings Online, uh, both as consulting and just playing. So that gets me a little bit of my RPG bug. Kind of jumping back to something you had mentioned, uh, and I'm sure we'll get into it a little bit more, but you had you had mentioned that the Peter Jackson films had kind of changed Tolkien scholarship. Um, but I'm wondering just a little bit before that, why... Why was Tolkien scholarship considered like silly and stuff like that? Why do you think that was? So the the older generation, I think the generation that had, you know, probably like were my dad's age, so that they had gone through the Tolkien hippiedom, um, you know, the great pop culture bloom of Tolkien in the late 1960s. Um, and they saw it as like frivolous and shallow and if, why are you you know don't you want to do real medieval stuff with real um you know thousand year old texts as opposed to things that are written in the 20th century um there there was just really this sense that it wasn't it wasn't something that uh you know, one of one of my uh professors said didn't say it's about tolkien but said it about other stuff that was sort of pop culture ish was like why teach them in class what they can read on the beach in the summer <laughs> and so there was there was that attitude, and that's why it's weird that Peter Jackson's um, films changed the scholarship, but they did uh, because it became such a massive, you know, it, even though as, as successful as Lord of the Rings was, it was still niche. You know, you couldn't really make, uh, like, Saturday Night Live would not make Lord of the Rings references, yeah. you know, before the, the Peter Jackson films. Yeah. And the films made it such a mass culture, Hollywood, um, you know, such a phenomenon that way that the the kind of powers that be in academia were like, well, it's what maybe it would be important to understand that. (laughs) And of course the people who'd been doing Tolkien scholarship for 25, 30 years were like, yes, yes, it would be important to understand that. Um, But you don't. (laughs) <laughs> because that happened a lot. You'd get, you know, some really shallow um, approach that, that like the, the great pitfall of Tolkien scholarship is, and I mean, I did this, so I can definitely, you know, not being uh, speak from, from personal knowledge is to come to this whole thing with the attitude, like, well, clearly I'm probably the first well-educated person to think about this material. <laughs> And then you find out, no, actually, every single point you brought up has been brought up since 1974 or whatever, when, you know, various books were, were published. And usually it's Tom Shippey's already said that. Is the, <laughs> is, and if it's not, it's Merlin Flieger already said that uh, for almost any point that someone would bring up. If you're just, you know, shallowly, like, just coming into it, like, oh, yeah, did you know that the Sauron is... Uh, He's the Dark Lord. Isn't that racist? And, you know, then someone who actually knows a little bit about Tolkien, you're like, yeah, interesting how the, the men of Gondor wear black uniforms, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And the Saruman is the white, and the white, oh, well, that's not what I meant. And then you realize the person hasn't really thought through and hasn't worked through the, the material. So yeah. the, the fact that Jackson's films were so, so widely successful, had the the paradoxical effect of making Tolkien scholarship, which we'd been trying to build and, and work on for years before them, um, made it respectable. It seems like there's kind of a twisted little bit there where 
if it's pop culture, it's not important, but the movies made it pop culture. So now you can be important again or something. Right. It was, it's, it's because there's, there's pop culture and there's like the wrong kind of pop culture, you yeah. know, pop culture that nerds like, well, yeah. that's not, you know, there's not movie stars involved. There's not big Hollywood studios. That's just a bunch of um, nerds reading books. Yeah. Or rolling dice. But when it's, you know, a multi-billion dollar corporation um, doing it with famous people, then, you know, you need to take notice in, in some way. And I will say, like, that Jackson's films, they brought it to a massively larger audience. As yeah. big as the reading audience had been, it's nothing compared to what the, yeah. the film audience is. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. Just thinking too, it just seems like there are some things like, um, I don't know if it's just because of the certain subject matter, but like if you take an example from movies, um, you know, every once in a while you'll see the, the, the list of the top 100 greatest movies ever made or something. And uh, I'm just always shocked that those, mo- those lists don't include, say, The Road Warrior or Jaws, which are probably two of the greatest movies ever made, but they just don't get listed because other things kind of just, you know, take precedence in them. And I'm just wondering if that was something that was going on with Lord of the Rings as well. I think so. Like with literature, absolutely. Like, the, I mean, Tom, Tom Shippey titled his uh, 2000, I think 2003, maybe it's 2002, his, his uh, second Tolkien book, you know, author of the century mm-hmm. to be deliberately provocative yeah. because people, you know, T- Shippey would point out that if you're going to say that uh, there's a work that reflects like wide readership in the 20th century, it's not Joyce. It's not, you know, even Hemingway or, um, or Faulkner, it's Tolkien by a landslide. Yeah. Of a text that then people are like, well, yeah, but that's not, you know, what about like, yeah, Jonathan Livingston Seagull was popular or something. But it's, I think what Chippy and I and, and many others are, are saying is it's not just the popularity. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a serious, effective, powerful work of literature with its own unique style. It's just not part of what was defined as, you know, mainstream literary writing which was much more the, you know, the, what Shippey calls the Sonnenkinder, the uh, Virginia Woolf and the Bloomsbury crew and, you know, people who wrote in a certain way about certain things and Tolkien wanted to do something different. And in that way, he sort of like continued a uh, pre-World War, World War I tradition of writing that was mainstream but the difference was, you know, after World War I, Siegfried Sassoon and others are like, well, that just has to end. We can't do this anymore. And, you know, and in hindsight, it's like, well, that was a little premature, wouldn't you say? Um, <laughs> to decide that, that, you know, sentiment and nostalgia and honor and love of beauty was, was gone forever as opposed to, you know, was you didn't feel right saying it in, you know, 19... 19- 25 or something like that Mm -hmm. and i mean let me just just because of say like world war one just like sapped all the romance and beauty out of the world is that kind of the idea like you know that's like hemingway's uh thing in um i mean so many writers said this like that it's hemingway says it in to have and have not like you're once you or i think it is you've heard you know they heard the words duty and honor and country and and they're now meaningless because you've seen the bloated corpses of your friends lying in a ditch or whatever and I think Tolkien would say, well, 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 I did agree that, it made, that, that those things made it meaningless. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't, I, you can agree that the war was terrible and the war was not the glorious, you know, adventure that people hoped and that it ended poorly. But that doesn't actually prove the point that you're trying to make that traditions and, and um, you know, the, it's the same idea that we're now finally wrapping our heads around that, no, actually, it, it wasn't, you know, the, the love of Germanic culture that caused Nazis and Hitler and World War II. It was a lot of other stuff that, that, that you know, just that they, they used um, the, the, the popularity of, uh, you know, or the, the folk traditions and so forth and the imagery and, and, and things like that. Those things didn't cause it. And, and no more did, you know, patriotism, um, 
love of con- country, uh, love of comrades cause World War I. But it was, I think, hard to see that in 1925. Yeah. But Tolkien did. Yeah, right. Um, I believe somebody, uh, I can't remember, somebody who said, uh, uh, you no longer sang when going into the battle after the psalm, right? <laughs> Mm-hmm. And um, but of course, uh, Tolkien there has some great authority because he was at the Somme. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's and Shippy points that out all the time that it's Siegfried Sassoon. He he fought like he gets he gets the uh, you know mm-hmm. he has a right to make um, to make evaluations. But a lot of the the people who were saying these things didn't fight and are not basing it on experience, but were basing it on ideology or basing it on you know. Being sadly basing it on being on Stalin's payroll for some of them, <laughs> and um, you know that's just I think what Tolkien caught was was that that the rest of the culture uh, hadn't had a vote yet yeah. on throwing away the, those discussions, and then as as Shippey points out, really the the central issue of the 20th century has to be how could supposedly civilized people the most civilized in the world be so evil and be so destructive and violent and cruel. And yet that 20th century fiction didn't talk about that. Yeah. You know, 20th century fiction was focused on internal struggles maybe, or domestic drama or um, the, 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 you know, really other important things, Faulkner and, you know, the, 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 the weight of history and so forth. But really what people wanted to talk about was what the heck has gone wrong? And the only way to do it was fantasy. Like there was just this huge open area that, that people were not um, working through. And I think that's the same kind of thing as why did Tolkien suddenly become so popular, you know, during the height of the Vietnam War? Because there wasn't a good way to, to talk about the like it's 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 a better way to talk about those things in Middle Earth because you're not immediately tied into all the the tangle of contemporary politics in some way, but you're still getting at what the really big issues are. Do you think that is why there is such an appeal to Tolkien's writing because he speaks of duty, honor, respect, and things that um, are sometimes just. Uh, kind of maybe uh, downplayed in kind of modern society or culture? Yeah. Well, I think that, yes. And I, I think it's because also that, I mean, I think we're seeing this right now in our whole wonderful coronavirus world, yeah. right? Like individual people still do a lot of good. Yeah. They do a lot of things that are, that are kind and respectful and, and following their duty and, and brave and we can we can agree that the systems are are screwed up or that the collectives are are horrible and and so forth but we can also agree that there's a lot of individual heroes and the things that they do make a difference and that's what tolkien insists upon in the lord of the rings more than anything else more than anything political or big picture it, it the, the the whole book just it, it insists that things that individuals do matter that they matter if you if you make the right decision, even if it's painful and hard for you, and 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 people want to talk about that. I don't, and you don't know if it, it it totally reinforces, you know, that everything will turn out all right if you do things the right way. There's an awful lot of sacrifice. Mm-hmm. I mean, Frodo's our hero, and he ends up, you know, post traumatic stress syndrome, shell shock, wounded, unable to enjoy the Shire that he uh, yeah. saved. I think. But, it- it matters, yeah. And that's I think that's a, that's essential to our, to for all of us. We we yeah. that's how our lives work. I, I think I've I've kind of always noticed, you know, wh- when I reread, is this kind of the idea that it's just like Frodo makes all of these great sacrifices and he is broken and he can't enjoy the Shire anymore, but he makes it possible for there to be a Shire. I always thought, um, is that kind of reflective on the soldiers who go to war and then they don't come back. The ones that don't come back don't get to enjoy it, but they preserved something for other people to enjoy. I think that's absolutely it. And I think that's the, that's the way that you keep sane. I think after you've 
gone through that and seen your best friends be killed and, and, you know, and not had a clear convincing victory. Yeah. Right. And make it feel, you know, I'm sure it did seem, and, and maybe it was that all of that sacrifice and, 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 and suffering was for nothing because we had to turn around and do it again 20 years later. And so, yes, absolutely. And I would also point out that, that, and this is where like my read of the Lord of the Rings is very different than I think a lot of the, I don't know, the, the, some, some scholars, but more just, um, you know, a lot of people who criticize it. Uh, I don't think that there's cheap grace in the Lord of the Rings at all. I think that it actually works through a lot of really difficult and complex situations. Uh, and, and times people don't even recognize that they're there. So I'll give one example. Uh, I am a heretic on this point. I don't know anyone else who says it, says it, but I would argue that Frodo, one of the reasons he suffers so much is that he uses the ring. And I don't mean like to, you know, to disappear even from Boromir or in, uh, and the prancing pony, but when he puts his hand on the ring and commands Gollum to swear, he's using the ring. He's using the ring in exactly the way that Sauron uses it to dominate people. And it's from that moment on that things get much worse for Frodo, where, you know, Sam has to really take over the leadership and, and he, Frodo, just feels more weighed down. And I don't think that's an accident. I mean, I think it's, it's it intended by Tolkien to stay like Frodo had no choice or he only had bad choices, right? He could either kill Gollum, which would just be morally wrong. He could leave him tied up with the rope, which was also morally wrong because Gollum couldn't stand it, would have gone insane or, or died. Or he could use the ring to dominate Gollum so that he wouldn't have to kill him. And that's the least of the bad choices but it's still a bad choice like that's what Tolkien how he Tolkien's bravery in there is to say it's still a bad choice it's still morally wrong to dominate someone in any way that like exercising power over other people against their will is always morally wrong but you sometimes have to do it for the the bigger you know to save the shire to save the to save the world and to me, that's a sophistication that actually doesn't exist in a lot of the seemingly much more sophisticated literature of the 20th century is, is the recognition that there's, there's morally wrong things going on all the time. And the difference is about the good guys is that the, the, the good guys don't revel in, in it and they try to make it right when they have a chance. Mm-hmm. And that's the, the difference between them. So, I mean, you can, I think see that, that there's, you know, Frodo pays a great price and Tolkien suggests that like, you know, there's a reason that he had to. I'm just wondering too, you kind of touched on it a little bit. What are some popular misconceptions do you think of the Lord of the Rings that are out there that you hear people talk about? The the biggest misconceptions are the, the ones that have been around for the longest too, is that the characters are all flat that they're the ones there are obviously good ones and obviously evil ones and nobody um, with any complexity or sophistication or in between Mm -hmm. and that the moral choices are all straightforward and Mm -hmm. all of those are wrong. All of those are not the case. Um, In part, it's because you, you have to read the Lord of the Rings differently. Uh, In many ways, Tolkien got techniques from old Norse, even though he doesn't, you know, the, the sagas are one of the areas that he visibly draws on the least of his medieval texts. Like there's not a lot of quotes or lines from them, but the overall style, it comes from the sagas where one of the things that happens is that you'll have a scene that if you're just a naive reader to it, almost nothing seems to happen. Like someone says something and then the other person, it says his knuckles whitened on the handle of his ax, but he said no more. But if you know the whole story, it turns out like these people, their families have been murdering each other for six generations. And you, you know, the one person just said like the absolutely unforgivable insult, and this is going to lead to death. And everyone in the audience understood that mm-hmm. because they knew the, the backstories and so forth. But when we read it now, we're like, oh, really nothing happened in that scene. Well, it's the same thing that's happening in Tolkien all, all the time. 
And I'll give one example that's actually a, a later, like a retcon from Tolkien, but I think it works perfectly. Tolkien decided, well, after he wrote The Lord of the Rings, that back in Valinor in the Elder Days, the great elvish smith Fionor had once asked Galadriel for some strands of her hair so he could make some beautiful jewel or something, um, you know, incredibly wonderful. He's the greatest craftsman ever. He made the Silmarils, you know, it's his grandson who makes the rings and so forth. And Galadriel said, no, she didn't like Fino. And you're like, you're not going to get any my hair, you creepo, um, or something to, to that effect. So that when Gimli looks on Galadriel and she says, what gift would you have, you know, dwarf who's been sort of enemies with my uh, people for years and, and all this. And he's like, oh, I wouldn't ask for anything except maybe some, uh, a lock of your hair. And all the elves go, ah, because Gimli doesn't know that 6,000 years before, you know, Fionor tried, got, Fionor, the greatest elf ever, got turned down on this. Mm -hmm. And then Galadriel, like, smiles and showing how she's changed and developed. She cuts the strands of her hair and, and gives them to him. And it's, it, and, and again, if you read, just naively read that scene, it's mm -hmm. kind of cute. Like, oh, could I have some of your hair? Sure you can. Um, but with the, the history embedded behind it, it becomes much more powerful. And it shows a lot about Galadriel, and it shows a lot about Gimli's um, kind of naivete as a, as a younger dwarf compared to these incredibly ancient elves. And it shows, like, the hobbits have no clue at all what's going on, which is normally how they, they are anyway. <laughs> and so I don't think, you know, that, that, that idea that there's shallowness. Or another example is Boromir. When Boromir is dead and floating down the river in the boat and his brother Faramir sees him mm -hmm. and notices the uh, elvish belt and then is talking about this to Frodo and, and Faramir says, what said she to you, Boromir, that lady who dies not? Now, like, mm -hmm. why would Faramir say that? Well, I think if you put it together with Galadriel's testing of Boromir, uh, which she does to all the members of the company, I think Galadriel overstepped her bounds. She's an elf queen, not a goddess, and she's not supposed to be tempting anyone. And it was her tempting Boromir by showing him what it would be like with the ring that I think helped push him over the edge as well as the, the power of the ring itself. So it shows that, that, you know, even amazing, beautiful, wonderful Galadriel isn't perfect. Either, in fact, and and on the other side, Boromir, he's we don't see him enough as the great man that he is because, as Tolkien rewrote the the book, uh, he gave all of Boromir's good lines to Aragorn because Aragorn had originally been Trotter, the Hobbit who wore wooden shoes, but once he became Aragorn, the King of Men, he snagged a lot of Boromir's princely lines, and so we didn't learn enough about Boromir to feel as bad as we should that he was a great, great man who had fallen uh, as opposed to just being a jerk who wanted the ring. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with Denethor. Denethor is, you know, a throwback to the great princely, uh, brilliant, um, studious, and uh, martially vigorous uh, Numenorians, and, and he fails. And, and his loss is, is a great uh, tragedy also. But you have to read closely uh, mm -hmm. for, for that, and you have to know the, the backstory. And so I think that those are some of the misconceptions. And the same thing with all good and all evil. I mean, Saruman, pretty evil now, but obviously wasn't in the past. Mm -hmm. Denethor does some horrible things, including planning on burning his sick son alive, but had been a very, a very good man. Um, you know, worm tongues fall, uh, yeah. Theoden's rise, and you don't, everyone forgets how crappy Theoden was before Gandalf kind of cured him. So, mm -hmm. yeah, the whole, like, that there's, oh, there's just, it's obvious. No, it's not. In fact, the characters argue all the time about, well, quick, we got to use the ring and defeat Sauron, and then we can throw it away. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's, that gets missed by people who, who don't understand how to read the text. I think it's uh, you were just touching on there how you know uh, how the different characters seem to have their different falls, and I think that speaks into the idea that it's you know that 
Theoden was a noble king, but he's now corrupted. And that, you know, Saruman was this, you know, a wonderful noble wizard, but now he has fallen. And I, I think that idea of corruption um, is something that's, that's kind of often missed as well. Absolutely. And it's, it's interesting that, um, you know, one of the books that people call the Toll Clones um, that, you know, that came out in the 70s and 80s uh, yeah. to capitalize on Lord of the Rings, um, Stephen R. Donaldson's Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, which tries to be anti-Tolkien in a few places and gets so stuck in Tolkien's shadow that like the climactic scene happens in a volcano. And I mean, like, come on, <laughs> how many volcanoes are there just sitting around the landscape? Um <laughs> But one of the things that he does really well is that his Lord Fowl, the despiser, like the worst names ever in Stephen Donaldson, but um, his, his Lord Fowl is all about corruption, about, you know, causing something to rot from the inside. And I mean, if I don't want to get political, but I want to say that that corruption is like the central sin of our own time. And that's another reason why I think a lot of, you know, people who are very high placed and successful and so forth don't like the Lord of the Rings because it points out how terrible corruption is when we have, a, you know, a, a large chunk of our elite that says, like, not only is it not corrupt, it's, it's what you should do. It's what you have to do. You have to take care of yourself first. And the, you know, Tolkien and Lord of the Rings is saying, and that's the problem, right? Like saying, mm -hmm. taking the ring and first defeating Sauron, but I promise you later I'll throw it in the volcano. That's the source of failure and destruction. I guess I'm just wondering why, because I've seen it as well, just even in my limited reading and stuff, uh, that, that people often just paint the Lord of the Rings as black and white morality, no complexity, you know, to the character's moral choices and things. And I'm just trying to, I've just always just been like, I just don't even, it's just like, did you read it? Because like, I don't know how you get to that. Um, just because... I mean, it is so clear how complex it is, but is it just because there's elves and dwarves and those are like kitty things or something? Yes, like absolutely. It's like, th that's, um, you know, Ed Edmund Wilson, uh, Shippy really calls him out for the has this, you know, thing about the great writer, Wilson says, the great writer follows his interest wherever it leads him, even if it is to incestuous dukes in Tierra del Fuego. But, you know, as Shippy says, but not elves. Elves are way right out. That's just a step too far. We can have incest and we can have Tierra del Fuego, but if you put an elf in there, absolutely not. And I think that, yes, that there, there's the sense that if you have like elves and dwarves and dragons, um, it is, it's, it's fairy tale, it's childish, it's, um, it can't possibly be serious. And then there's other, uh, you know, oh, well, there's no real sex in The Lord of the Rings. Um, so it can't be uh, important or there's uh, th the black and white thing. It does. It is maddening. Or when people say like, oh, well, clearly the uh, orcs are meant to be like dark skinned humans. Um, I don't know about clearly because there's actual dark skinned humans in the Lord of the Rings, right? The Haradrim and the, the Easterlings. So y you can't exactly say that, oh, well, orcs are meant to, because the orcs aren't, aren't those people. It, it's just, like, it's very, it's a very superficial reading. And, and it's a reading that's about making, you know, I, I don't know, I try to get this, get my students out of this mode of, it's a way to feel really superior to someone, to either people who, who, you know, like the book or who lived a longer time ago and don't care about the same political things that, that we care about. It's this idea that we're much more, you know, we've progressed and we are better than our ancestors and so forth. And, and it's about making yourself like, well, I might not be X or Y, but I certainly, you know, can, uh, can see that this is too simple. And, and, you know, they get caught up in the word dark Lord. Um, uh, and they, for, they don't even notice the, the black livery of the, um, livery of the, people of Gondor or the white hand or any of, of the complexity. And it's all just like, Oh yeah, see it's, I mean, and Jackson's movie had caused some of that too, where like every elf has long flowing blonde hair yeah. when it's really only Galadriel and the, um, the, 
Vanyar back in in Valinor who have the the gold hair. Yeah, I, th- I think sadly, yeah, we get caught up on some trivial things or or some simplifications here and there, and think it it applies to the whole work as a whole and, or something. And, and the other side of it is that there's there's so I mean I'm I'm doing some special pleading here, but in <laughs> fantasy in general, I mean, and people even call them orcs. Like you need orcs, yeah. you need something that you can fight against and and kill to have good battles that aren't all, you know, other human beings that you can feel bad about. Yeah. And whether that's, you know, George Lucas and put everybody in white um, armor so you can't see their faces or it's scary looking orcs. I mean, you, you, as a mechanism, you need orcs. Yeah. Because otherwise it's like, cause when, when humans get killed, right. Sam, um, Sam says it. he sees the, the dead uh, soldier of Harrod and, mm-hmm. and, he, and he immediately, instead of being like, oh, what an evil guy, I'm glad he's dead. He's yeah. like, I wonder what lies, you know, yeah. brought him here and so far from home. And if he really hated people or if he was just tricked and if he just wanted to be left in peace. Mm-hmm. And I mean, those are really, that's a really powerful scene and it's important stuff, but it would not make a good epic battle. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, you and so Tolkien came up with orcs and orcs don't appear to have you know, if you, in what we are shown, they don't have families, they don't have, um, you know, children and they don't love, they're just, they're like flies, you know, so it's okay to, to kill them because you need to for the mechanism. That's why I really hate the whole like, oh, well, clearly the, the orcs are meant to be um, minority races. Like, God, that's horrible. I, I know plenty of minority people and none of them look like orcs um, or act like orcs. So, like that's, I mean, see where it comes from. And, you know, I, I think it would be different uh, if Tolkien were writing today, uh, a few of the individual lines and, and things. But overall, I, I, as he said, uh, to, to complain that no quarter is given to orcs in a work that uh, exudes mercy from one end to the other is a little bit perverse. Yes, I, I agree with that. Absolutely. Because yes, he is. They're always trying to figure out <laughs> when and how to show mercy. Yeah. Frodo um, says, as for me, I pity even his slaves. Yeah. And they, it's almost even like in some cases, yeah, we show mercy to the orcs, but they, they're just not made for that. They're not, they're not whole things. Right. They wouldn't know how to accept it. And that's why um, it's really interesting. To, this is an unknown little tidbit. Um, in Tolkien, some of his draft material about Beowulf that I looked at at uh, Oxford, he, um, he translates the word orkneas, which is in, in Beowulf, um, mm-hmm. and is usually translated as like animated corpses. Uh, he translates it as barrow whites. And you can see, I think, his thinking about the orcs, where in the Silmarillion, it says that they are sort of the animated corpses of elves. Yeah. But then he had the problem that there were just not enough elves to produce that many orcs. Yeah, but if orcs are in some way like uh, you know like the way that the the Buffy verse does vampires right where it's an evil spirit that takes over your body, um, and actually killing it then sets your spirit free, um, then it becomes okay to kill the orcs mm-hmm. because they're evil spirits just embodied in. But uh, and now to be fair, Tolkien didn't want to do that for various. Um, metaphysical re- reasons about how um, Morgoth could or couldn't create things and, and so forth. But, but just the general idea is you need bad guys that it's okay to kill for yeah. the purpose of the mechanism of the story or the game. Yeah. And that the evil one doesn't have the power of creation. They just have the power of corruption. Yes. And that then Tolkien gets, that's another thing though, that you, Tolkien, you know, gets, you get tangled up in it because do those orcs and dragons and other things, do they have free will and uh, do they have then a spirit or something? Because the power of literature is such that as far as we're concerned, anything that can talk or has feelings has free will. Yeah. Because we just, it's a character. It can be a toaster. Yeah. You know, but it's a brave little toaster. (laughs) And and so the, the power of literature means that as soon as Shagrat, or the trolls, or anybody speaks, they they become a you know a, a character and therefore a human and therefore the potential to be uh, redeemed or to be not entirely evil, which messes up the story. Mm-hmm. So yeah. 
you know, that's just, he was just, he was, there was no way he spent so much time on it and there's nobody smarter thinking about these things and it still isn't resolvable because it's just, it's just a feature of the way literature works. I'm wondering too, in, in, in your studies, I, just thinking, you know, we touched on a few themes that you can find in Lord of the Rings. Obviously there are many, but are there some themes or a main theme maybe that you think that just people miss oftentimes? I think that the single main theme, the most powerful theme, and, not, and some people get this, um, but many people miss it and they think that, you know, that's, and, and, it, and it is also about heroism and sacrifice. Mm-hmm. But I think that um, a, a big function, a big theme in the Lord of the Rings and, and a function of the story is to engage with um, the word, with nostalgia. Mm-hmm. And I think that the German word that was the source of that word nostalgia is better um, because nostalgia has, you know, it's called, it's coded as having bad characteristics or whatever, but, um, it comes from a German word. It's a Latin translation of a German word, Heimweh, which means home pain, which is a little bit like our homesickness, but, but much more intense. And I think that that is the sort of dominant emotional motif of the Lord of the Rings. It's about the pain of the loss of your home that many characters are feeling as they are displaced and exiled and, and moved around. And what Tolkien is saying there and in other places is every human feels that just because we are, we are incarnate in the stream of time. We, we grow up and we leave our childhoods and we age and we lose people that we love and, and care about. And so we feel that home pain. And, and I think that that's why when people say like the dominant motif of Lord of the Rings is glory or achievement, I'm like, no, it's sadness. <laughs> it's deep sadness. And at one point he says, um, sadness without bitterness. And that's what Tolkien was, I think, striving for, like in his personal life mm-hmm. and in his writing. That's what he wanted to get to was where you just don't have the bitterness anymore, but you still are going to have the sadness for what is fallen and lost and gone. And in fact, it's what, it's the elves' great sin in Middle Earth that causes them to make the rings of power. They want to have it both ways. They want to preserve, you know, Lothlorien and Rivendell as preserved in this bubble of time and never changing and, and always perfect. And there's no stain and there's no age and death and and everything else in them. And that's wonderful. But at the cost of that is becoming the slaves, slaves to Sauron. If you know, with his ring and the cost of that is losing your, your freedom uh, to do anything because you have to go through life never changing and therefore never being um, free. And I, and I think that that is that, that recognition of something that, that we all desire to, to some degree and the impossibility of that. And then finally, the, uh, therefore, the, the uh, reaching out for technology or, ma- or magic or power or wealth in order to try to do that false thing, um, that's a theme at the center of the, the, the book that sometimes gets missed. I think that comes across in the choices of Master Samwise. Yes, when, absolutely. Yeah, when he's like my own garden or a thousand troops to command or, you know. Yeah, or turn the whole land of Mordor into a garden. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's, that's actually, that, thank you for saying that. I hadn't, I hadn't connected that particular scene in that way, but that actually works beautifully to show what the trap is. Yeah. I mean, the, one of the trap is that Sam is just being, you know, he says even like Sauron would just daunt me and trick me and take me uh, as soon as I did that. But it's also like, yeah, this is what you can do. You want your beautiful garden and everything back. Mm-hmm. You can make the whole world your garden. Yeah. But that's the only way to do it is yeah. to enforce that upon everyone else. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then, so you lose your own garden in the process. You lose yourself and you destroy everything in the process. Now, a- another thing that I was thinking about, I, again, I may be wrong because I, I am a non-academic who's done just enough reading to make myself dangerous, I think. But um, <laughs> when I read the Anglo-Saxon elegies, I, I think that's how you pronounce Yes. 
Okay. When I read those, obviously I can see the influences upon Tolkien and the, of course the writers of Rohan and, and things mm-hmm. like that and then Tolkien's writings. I get this sense too that there is um, kind of just like reading the Anglo-Saxon elegies. I get this picture of maybe this, you know, this person wandering through the, the wilderness going from, you know, little village to little village and he sees on the way like uh, the ruins of this Roman uh, you know, house or villa and ruins of this Roman bath or something. And, and he's just wondering what happened to the world? Like, how have we fallen from this grandeur? Uh, mm-hmm. Do you pick up some, kind of that as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, the, the wanderer, the seafarer, the wife's lament, the ruin, um, the set of uh, Anglo-Saxon poems all in the, the Exeter book that, that treat on these themes in different ways. Uh, I think what they show is everything you just said, and, and also that the Anglo-Saxons, they knew that they were culturally inferior to their predecessors. They couldn't build in stone like the Romans. I mean, they couldn't support a, 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 the number of people. The, the, the pop, I was shocked to learn that the population of Britain did not get back to the Roman level until the 16th century. <laughs> That's mind-boggling, right? Like, yeah. the, 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 the Romans were so far ahead of everything that happened there. And you'd walk around and see these, yeah, you know, these ruined buildings and know that you couldn't do that. And it, it created this, this deep sense of, of inferiority and of living in a fallen world, which I think we see all the time in the Lord of the Rings. They, they you know, the, the dwarves and the hobbits say like, or, or sorry, it's, uh, it's in the, at the council of Elrond. We can't do, you know, only in stone building can we achieve uh, as much as our, as our fathers. We just can't do the metal work and the other things that they did. And, and that's a recurrent theme, right? The, the people in the past could do much greater stuff yeah. than we can. Yeah. And I talked about this with my students recently, and they pointed out to me this uh, genre that I didn't really know about of, uh, I already didn't have a name for it, of American Gothic, mm-hmm. of things that, you know, Stephen King's The Stand would be uh, an early example, but things like Fallout, uh, the, the, I believe that's what it is, the video game, and, and where, you know, the American landscape is, is reconfigured as ruins. And they said, like, that American Gothic is, like, they feel like that's what they're living in right now. Um, that, that things that are supposed to be thriving and bustling are, are empty factories and, you know, decaying buildings and 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 so forth. And I think it gives an insight into what the Anglo-Saxons felt also. I mean, I, you know, I would just say like, we keep talking about that we're going to put, uh, put people back on the moon, but I'm 50 something years old and it, it's been my whole lifetime. I, I that was we just haven't been able to do that. So like we are in some ways. And so what we try to focus on is how we're, but we're morally superior to our yeah. predecessors, but we're not. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, I was just thinking of that when you were mentioning that. It's just the, the idea. It's like, well, now we can say our ancestors went to the moon, but we don't. Yeah. You know, and that, that picks up kind of that strain. And then your point about being moral superior is, is, is well made, I think. <laughs> and that was what the Anglo-Saxons thought also in, that, in, the, in the time period is that they were like, well, but we are, they weren't Christians and we are, and we're going to be like the best Christians because Pope Gregory picked us out specially to convert us to Christianity. And therefore that's how we're going to be great, which is fine. Um, I mean, and it's the Puritans, you know, do the same thing 600 years later, but it doesn't come from a position of strength. It comes from a position of weakness mm-hmm. of like, we can't do those, those other things. So we'll do, you know, we'll be morally superior. Boy, that's depressing, especially given that, um, yeah. you know, we're all, cowering inside from an epidemic. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So I try to look at that as more positive. Like 50 years ago, we wouldn't have even known it was coming, I don't think, until it was way too late. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, we would have just gotten sick. and People would have just started dying. And and then you're like, oh, it's an epidemic coming from, um, you know, it's like the Spanish flu where there was nothing to be done by that point. So hopefully we have used our science and stuff to prevent that yeah yeah 
Well, you know, I know I've kind of let time get away uh, and I want to respect your time. <laughs> I want to respect your time. It's just so fascinating to get to talk like this because, uh, you know, a lot of times I don't. Um, now, of course, a lot of people in my audience have read Lord of the Rings. I know there's some who are probably, it's on their list to get to it or something like that. But if, if somebody has read the Lord of the Rings or they, you know, they read it years ago or something like that, and they're thinking about, you know, hearing our conversation and they're thinking about reading it again, what would just be something you would tell them, like, you know, right when they go to maybe reread Lord of the Rings? Oh, wow. I, of all the, I've never gotten that exact question before. Um, okay. when they maybe it's to, a bad one. I don't know. No, no. I think it's, really, it's a really interesting one. Like, what would I say? So when I'm, I know what to say to people who've never read it before, okay. which is fight your way through chapter one and you'll be fine. <laughs> um, you know, I now love chapter one, but I see why a lot of people put the book down with all the, like, the little Hobbit jokes and stuff. You, yeah. you know, you've been told this is a giant epic and instead you're getting jokes about people's names and boating and jewels in the hill and stuff. <laughs> um, I would say when you, that the trick to reading it now, like if you pick it up again and, and, you know, you, you maybe you read it uh, as, a, as a kid or whatever is, is to, to read it with an eye for the subtleties with an eye for not so much like what is said, but what gets left unsaid or what is just a simple description or what are the things that are going on in the backgrounds of the scenes or, you know, far the, the, out of sight and see how much more there is going on than just the uh, the you know the adventure part, which is great and fun. Don't don't get me wrong on that. Like, but there's also a lot more going on subtly. If somebody's read it closely and they want to go beyond it, now of course there's the Silmarillion and some of the Tolkien uh, Christopher Tolkien's material that they've put out. But like, if they wanted to get into some of Tolkien's influences, is it even accessible for a non-academic to read some of the, uh, uh, absolutely. absolutely. Some of his influences. Uh, I I teach uh, a lot, a lot of them, um, in medieval lit. I would say that Seamus Heaney's a modern English translation of Beowulf is probably the single best thing you can read. Uh, Heaney really captures the feel of the poem, even though he has to put it into modern English Mm -hmm. and he, and that was one of Tolkien's uh, stylistically, the idea of, you know, that there are just these big unexplained vistas, these, these things off in the distance that the author just assumes the audience knows. So you have the sense that you're in a much wider world. Mm-hmm. That comes from Beowulf. And uh, so Seamus Heaney's translation of Beowulf, um, Tolkien himself translated Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, which is another... Uh, great influence on him. The problem is his translation of Gowan and the Green Knight is, uh, is actually kind of hard. It's very archaic compared to some of his other stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's why I would actually recommend um, Marie Boroff's uh, translation of Gowan and the Green Knight. And then I'd recommend Seamus Heaney's translation of Beowulf rather than Tolkien's because his is it's just a prose translation. It's very straightforward, but it doesn't give you the, the, the feel of, uh, of poetry. And, and then the other uh, thing is the old Norse material. And a lot of people go and reasonably, they read the, the poems of the elder Edda, uh, which are amazing. And Carolyn Larrington's translation of them is very good. But um, I actually think that reading some of the saga prose texts, even though there aren't like the specific like call outs, you won't see like the names of the dwarves and the names of Gandalf and stuff as you do in the poetry. Um, the saga texts give you a sense of how to read, particularly how to read the Silmarillion and, and how things like family relationships and backstory, uh, you know, it just it influences everything, but it's not all shown. Um, the, the easiest of those to get into is uh, Hravenkel's saga, H-R-A-F-N-Kel, uh, K-E-L, Hravenkel's saga, which is really short, and it's in a beautiful little Penguin edition that has some other Icelandic uh, short pieces, uh, including Thorstein the Staffstruck and Auden and the Polar Bear, which are both awesome. Um, and then of the, the, what are called the, like the great sagas, the big sagas, um, Njal saga is by far the best, N-J-A-L, uh, but the problem is that it's, it's really long and it's got 400 characters. <laughs> <laughs> it is truly great. 
Uh, but I think the one thing that might be an easier introduction is um, Ail Saga, E-G-I-L. Uh, Ail Saga, he's the first great poet serial killer in um, Icelandic uh, literature. And that's a, that's a good way. And then some books, some like secondary books that are really useful um, is Tom Shippey's latest book, Laughing Shall I Die, uh, The Lives and Deaths of the Great Vikings, which is wonderful. And then uh, Song of the Vikings by Nancy, I'm not remembering her last name. It's a misleading title. It's really, it's all about Snorri Sturluson, the, the great um, uh, non-Viking, but Icelandic uh, poet. But she approaches all the material as like, this was Tolkien's, these were Tolkien's sources and they inspired me uh, when I learned about them to like the Lord of the Rings even more. So those are all like books that, that anyone who, uh, who likes the Lord of the Rings will certainly uh, enjoy. Great. I'm feeling a little good about myself. I've read a few of those, so I'll, I'll have to look into some other ones, though. But uh, thank you so much for that. Now, um, where can people learn more about you and some of your work? So um, my uh, michaeldrought.com website hasn't been revised in like eight years, oh, but wow. it's coming. A student is working on it for me during this um, little quarantine period. Uh, oh. And also, I uh, occasionally tweet things uh, at Mike Drought, all one word, at uh, at Twitter. Uh, and that's probably the best. I, I, I have a blog, but I don't use it very much. Um, wormtalk.blogspot.com. But uh, I, I'm going to get the Michael Drought website thing fixed up in the next couple weeks and that there will be more material there. We have a new volume of Tolkien, the journal Tolkien Studies coming out and um, lots of other stuff in the pipeline. Okay, well, uh, I will provide links to all of those uh, in the show notes for this episode at DiceGeeks.com. So uh, uh, all the listeners uh, should head over there and they can check out uh, what you're up to. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Drought, uh, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. And it's really nice. It was just fun to do after I've spent the, you know, the whole past week doing this um, online teaching which just because of the nature of lots of students and all trying to, you know, uh, get everyone's word in is very frustrating. So it was just nice to have a conversation with just one person. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was good. So thank you very much. Um, and, you know, if there's something else comes up again, I'd be happy to come back. Okay, well, there you have it, guys. Oh, my goodness. I enjoyed this conversation with Dr. Drought so much. It was just fantastic to finally just to be able to talk to somebody with so much knowledge about The Lord of the Rings um, after years and years of me reading it and rereading it and loving pretty much every word of it. It was so fantastic now to just be able to talk to uh, a Tolkien scholar. Uh, it, it just blew my mind, and I am so appreciative that Dr. Drought was willing to come on the show. As I mentioned, I have put links to his website and to his Twitter in the show notes for this episode at dicegeeks.com. Please head over there and check those out and you can learn what Dr. Drought is up to. Now, if you want some free stuff, head over to dicegeeks.com slash free. You will get 10 free dungeon maps. Plus, you'll never miss an episode of this show. Hey, guys, if you enjoyed conversations like this one that I had today with Dr. Drought, then please consider doing some things to help out the show. You can leave an honest review wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can tell a friend about the show. You can post about the show on your social media. Just get the word out. You could also support the show financially through Patreon. Just head over to Patreon dot com slash dice geeks and you can find out how to support the show there uh, it would mean the world to me if you would do any of those things now i thank you so much for listening and until next time keep gaming <laughs>